Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this, the 152nd Annual Memorial Day Service of Remembrance. I'm Eric Sitzelman, and I serve as the Tamako American Legion Post Number 173 Master of Ceremonies. I know it doesn't quite feel like Memorial Day without a parade and gathering in Oddfellow Cemetery, but even though we lose that tradition this year, it brings the opportunity for a unique and creative approach to our service. In fact, the number of Tamako area volunteers who have played a part in producing this program might make this service, more so than that of any previous year, a true community service. One of these changes may at first seem unusual, but the location where we film today's service includes the final resting places of some of the men and women from our area who gave their lives for our country. In this way, we can keep their names and sacrifices in the forefront of our memory. Moreover, will be reminded how their sacrifice summed up and perfected by one supreme act, the highest virtues of soldiers and citizens. And so we begin. I'm visiting Saints Peter and Paul Cemetery in Owl Creek and the resting place of Private First Class David Verbilla, who was the second person from Tamaqua to be killed in Vietnam. Our area had a number of other military personnel who served during the Vietnam era, one of whom is our Grand Marshal for today's observation. Brian Dom is a Navy veteran of the Vietnam War, and it's worth mentioning that his ship, the USS Mossapelia, was located in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, during both the Cuban Missile Crisis and the Bay of Pigs invasion. Brian returned to Tuscarora after his service and worked in the mines and for Bradley Codwell Warehouse in Hazleton. He is, and his wife Lucy live in Brockton. Brian, because today's scheduled parade was canceled, the Tamaqua Legion has named you as the Grand Marshal of the Veterans Day Parade, which gives you the unique honor of being the Grand Marshal on two different occasions in the same town in the same year. Brian, tell us where you are joining us from and comment on your status as a double Grand Marshal. I'm in St. Joseph's Polish National Cemetery in Brockton, visiting the resting place of Alexander Lakowitz, who lived in Mary D, was killed in Italy in World War II. I'm glad to be the Grand Marshal of Tamaqua and proud of serving in the United States Navy. Not many Civil War veterans have graves in their hometown. Tamaqua, in fact, has only two. One of these soldiers, Corporal Jeremiah DeLay, was killed in 1862 at the Battle of Charles City Crossroads and is buried here in St. Jerome's Old Cemetery in the South Ward section of Tamaqua. At our next site is the Memorial Day Poppy Queen, Emily Belts. 2020 marks the fourth year that Emily has served as the Poppy Queen. She is a fifth grade honor student at Tamaqua area, a member of the Junior Auxiliary of the Tamaqua Legion, and a member of the Tamaqua Elementary School Band. She is the daughter of Richard and Jennifer Belts. Emily, share with us where you're located. I'm visiting the Cenotaph of Edward Flannery in St. Jerome Cemetery. Edward was from Tamaqua and was killed in France in World War I. Thank you so much, Emily, and we'll see you again a bit later in the service. The White Church Cemetery in Rush Township is home to several men who died in times of war, and I'm standing at the resting place of Reese Jones. Reese grew up in Quake Ake and his life was taken during service in the Vietnam War. Mayor Nathan Grace now joins us from a location in Tamaqua. Nathan is the youngest mayor in Tamaqua's history and is certainly no stranger to the folks of town. Nathan, where are you joining us from? Uh, visiting the resting place of William Hankey, uh, who was a casualty of World War II. He's laid to rest here in St. John Lutheran Cemetery here in Dutch Hill and Tamaqua. He's one of the many war heroes that we remember on this day, just as we remember friends and family that we lost. With the introductions done, it seems fitting that I'm at the place where our usual Memorial Day service takes place, Oddfellow Cemetery in Tamaqua. At the moment, I'm standing a few yards away from Soldier Circle and the resting place of John Petrus, a World War II casualty and a member of the 331st Bomber Squadron, Army Air Force. At the monument behind me stands Joe Mahalko, a well-known vocalist in the Tamaqua area 
who will lead us in the singing of the national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight all the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming on the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say us that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Thank you, Joe, for sharing your talents with us. Just on the other side of the Civil War monument where Joe sang the national anthem is the resting place of Robert Kistler, a recipient of the Purple Heart who was killed in action in the Korean War. Our next stop is as far away from Soldier's Circle as our visits will take us today, where we're greeted by our guest clergy, Reverend James Williams of Zion Church, Lewistown Valley. Pastor Williams has been called to parishes in many states throughout our country, including Georgia, California, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, and he has spent time in Brazil as well. He and his wife Eileen live in Oregsburg. Pastor, please tell us where you are and lead us in invocation. I'm visiting the resting place of Carl Henry Burke, who served on an aircraft carrier in the Pacific Theater of World War II. He was killed when a ship came under attack in 1943. His wife, the former Arlene Strack, had already lost a brother to the war. Let us begin with prayer. Our Father, as we come together in this year to give memorial to those who have given their lives for our country, we pray that you will be among us. Bring your presence and your peace. Lord, it is a deep and awesome thing for someone to go off to war, but to never come back, it leaves a scar, it leaves a deep hole in us. We pray, Lord, you'd fill us. And as we think about them, remember faces long past, remember memories, remember our grief as well, that you will take us up and hold us and carry us forward so that we do not forget the lessons learned and that we too will go forward and be able to serve with the same strength and utter conviction that they did. We ask it in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Pastor. I'm in Skyview Memorial Park honoring someone else from World War II. Albert Wessner was a member of the 752nd Tank Battalion and was killed in Italy in 1944. Last year, we introduced into our service of remembrance the reading of the American Creed. Leading us in the recitation of the Creed will be the Tamaqua Business and Professional Women's Young Woman of the Year Award winner, Sarah McCabe. Sarah is a senior at Tamaqua Area High School, will attend l c then Quitstown for business management, and is the daughter of James and Angela McCabe. Given her award, she joins us now from an especially appropriate location. Sarah, tell us where you are. I'm visiting Oddfellow Cemetery and the resting place of Lois Krauss, who lived in Rhine Township and who died in the Philippines in 1944. She is one of only two women from the Tamaqua area that gave up their life in service to our country. In 1916, on the eve of the United States entry into World War I, Henry Sterling Chapin, the editor of an educational journal, devised a national writing competition to foster patriotism and civic responsibility among the U.S. citizens. William Tyler Page's submission to the contest, which he titled The American Creed, 
was awarded first prize over 3,000 other submissions. The American Creed is a statement of defining elements of the American identity. It is a summary of the fundamental principles of the American political faith as set forth in its greatest documents, its worthiest traditions, and by its greatest leaders. The Creed will appear on your screen as, as I read it. As citizens of this country, in a time of great divide, I invite you to recite it with me so that we can together affirm the beliefs that unite us. I believe in the United States of America as a government of the people, by the people, for the people, whose just powers are derived from the consent of the governed, a democracy in a republic, a sovereign nation of many sovereign states, a perfect union, one and inseparable, established upon those principles of freedom, equality, justice, and humanity for which American patriots sacrifice their lives and fortunes. I believe it is my duty to my country to love it, to support its constitution, to obey its laws, to respect its flag, and to defend it against all enemies. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and congratulations on receiving the BPW's Woman of the Year Award. Just over the hill from Sarah's location in Oddfellow Cemetery is St. Jerome Cemetery and the resting place of Private James Sullivan, an infantryman who was killed in Germany in 1945. One of those people who champions the cause of remembering the sacrifices of those in our armed forces is James Fredrickson, our guest speaker. Sergeant Fredrickson was raised in Andrews and is a 2005 graduate of the Tamaqua Area High School. James served for 12 years with the United States Army Reserve. In 2008, he was deployed to Iraq in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, where he served as the 744th Military Police Battalion Intelligence Section Sergeant and Lead Analyst at Camp Cropper, a theater internment facility in Western Baghdad. James graduated from Westchester University in 2012, but volunteered to deploy two additional times as a contracted analyst supporting Operation Enduring Freedom. In 2013, James deployed to Afghanistan, where he traveled as a member of Task Force 2010, and again in 2014, when he was deployed to support the 10th Mountain Division, culminating his military career with the receipt of seven Military Achievement Awards and eight service medals. In 2015, James moved to Northern Virginia and became a police officer with the Arlington County Police Department. In 2018, James resumed his career as an intelligence analyst and worked with the Defense Intelligence Agency prior to his current position at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. James and his wife, Amanda, regularly attend the wreath laying ceremonies at Arlington National Cemetery to honor those who have died in service to the nation. James recorded his address to us from his home in Virginia. Hello everyone, and thank you for attending this virtual Memorial Day service. My intent was to come back to Tamaqua and give this speech. However, due to the circumstances and in order to keep everyone safe and healthy, we will stick to this online presentation to remember and honor our American heroes who lost their lives. I hope that by the time I conclude this speech, you'll be able to take away a new perspective when remembering those on Memorial Day. But first, to all the medical professionals and healthcare heroes out there, thank you. And to everyone deemed essential, you're putting your well-being and your family's well-being at risk to help others and ensure we have the things we need to keep moving forward. It might not be what you signed up for or want it, but it is certainly appreciated by us all. This is a new battlefield that many of us are unfamiliar with, but we're all doing it together and we will get through this. But back to the reason why we are here. Memorial Day, or Decoration Day as they called it back then, began in the years following the Civil War and became an official federal holiday in 1971 as a day to remember, honor, and mourn those who died in active military service. More than 1.1 million men and women have died in wartime throughout the span of our nation's history. That's more than the populations of Detroit, San Francisco, or Washington, D.C. Of those 1.1 million, over 405,000 Americans were killed in World War II alone. That's more than the current population of New Orleans. And those numbers do not even include those who were wounded or went missing. That number is much higher. Although we are here today to commemorate and honor all these men and women, we especially remember the 92 individuals that we know of from Tamaqua who gave that ultimate sacrifice. Memorial Day sparks a lot of emotions for me and so many of you out there. 
Far too often on this day, I'll have a friend or family member say to me, thank you for your service or happy Memorial Day. Now, of course, I know their intention is sincere and well-meaning, but I often remind them that this day is a somber reminder of the brave sacrifices that complete strangers made for you and me to live freely in this country. I feel these types of things are said out of respect to veterans, both dead and alive, and that is their way of honoring these individuals. A few times now I had people ask me, how do I honor those on Memorial Day? And when I first got that question, I didn't really have an answer to it. Wear, display a red poppy, attend a Memorial Day event or service, display the US flag in your front yard. And while those are all excellent answers, it wasn't until a few years ago that I really think I found the answer to that question. It was nearing Christmas one year and I was working for the Arlington County Police Department. I had the opportunity to participate in wreaths across America at Arlington National Cemetery. I've been to Arlington National Cemetery a hundred times before this event. My favorite place to park my police cruiser, finish writing reports, and watch the sunrise each morning was at the U.S. Marine Corps, which is actually right next to the cemetery. But this was the first time I had the chance to attend this event. As I waited in line in the cold, I was truly humbled to see the line of people wrapped all the way down the walking path each one waiting for the opportunity to take a wreath off the truck and place it on a gravestone. I guess you could say I got a little lucky. I was still on duty and in uniform, so that allowed me to get to the front of the line. But at 8 a.m. sharp, the gates opened and I was able to secure a wreath. I began walking down the path between all the grave sites. As you get further away from the entrance, looking up and down the massive rows, the best words I can use to describe it would be that it's a somber, sober, and a beautiful resting place for our war veterans. If you've never been to Arlington National Cemetery before, it is the final resting place for more than 400,000 veterans and their families. The further I walked, I became overwhelmed with the number of grave sites to my one wreath. But as I continued, I began to gravitate towards an area called Section 53, and then to a specific grave. The reason I picked this specific one was because the individual had the same first name as my wife's grandfather. As I positioned the wreath and placed my hand on top of the stone, I began to read the individual's name. Private Emmett Parker, 26 April, 1893 to 12 January, 1957. Headquarters Company, 369th Infantry Regiment, 93rd Division, World War I Army. I asked the stranger to take a picture of this memorable moment and I stood over the gravesite a few moments longer. I said his name out loud once more before marking back in service and completing my shift but my mind was consumed with finding out more about this individual. For the rest of the day, I sought to learn more about Emmett. Through some research, I was able to learn more about Private Parker's service. The 93rd Infantry Division got its start as an all-black outfit during World War I. It was comprised of 14,000 soldiers and was organized at Camp Stewart, Virginia. The 369th was the first of the regiments to arrive in France in December 1917 and fought many ferocious battles alongside the French Army. They wore French or bluish tinted Adrian helmets, which is what their division patch eventually became, nicknamed the Blue Helmet Division. Throughout World War I, no other American division had as many days in continuous direct combat as the 369th Infantry Regiment. The 369th demobilized on 28 February 1919 at Camp Upton, New York. Although not much was found in my archival research of Private Parker's individual duties or service, I'm sure he played an important role in the overall effort of service to the nation. Private Parker was the first of many military veterans that I've since identified, researched, honored their service, and remembered their stories and sacrifice. So to wrap this all up, when someone asks me now, James, how do I honor those on Memorial Day? I give them the example I just gave you, and I tell them to learn about the lives of these individuals who signed on the dotted line, knowing clearly what it can mean for their lives. Learn their stories, say their name out loud, tell your friends and family about them, and allow this person's spirit to live on. If we can do that, then a part of them will live on and they will not be forgotten. The best way to thank a veteran on Memorial Day or any other day is to honor the fallen, to care for the wounded, and safeguard their families. It has truly been an honor to stand in front of you and speak about something I hold so dearly, so thank you for that. And God bless the fallen, our veterans and active military, and the United States of America. Thank you, James. I'm now visiting the resting place of World War I casualty Earl Arrow here in Zion Stone Cemetery in West Penn. Last year, we premiered a new element to this service called A Voice from Tamaqua's War Dead, and it was very well received. 
In the same way that the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington National Cemetery is representative of all men and women who were killed in times of war, this narrative of one of Tamako area's war dead is written to represent all of those from our area that we have lost to armed conflict. The narrative is written in the first person, but the identity of that person is not revealed, and it is meant to beg the question, how easily could this person's story have been your story or mine? The subject's name will be revealed in one week on Facebook, but the narrative is not meant to be a riddle to solve. It's instead meant to be a moment of humility for all of us who remain, and a stark reminder of what has been sacrificed for our benefit. This story is the result of months of research. There is no interpretation or extrapolation. Every detail of the story is documented by military records, civic documents, and eyewitness accounts. I was born in Hazleton in 1896, and my family moved to Tamaqua when I was very young. I was the oldest son of my parents' eight children, and in 1917, I was earning my family $18 a week working at Wetzel's Meat Market and driving cars for E.W. Davis. My mother was a very religious woman, so we were active in our church. I also belonged to one of Tamaqua's fire companies and the Manor Corps. I was drafted into the Army and on April 1st, 1918, was inducted into the 28th Division of the 109th Infantry. On May 3rd, I was on board the Anchises, headed from Brooklyn to France. My division was positioned at the western front of the German advance, close to the Marne River in Chateau Cherry. The situation was dismal. On July 14th, when the German assault collided with the main force of the 28th, the fighting became bitter hand-to-hand -hand combat. We repelled the German forces in a decisive victory, but we suffered heavy losses. That day of fighting prompted General John Pershing to refer to the 28th soldiers as men of iron and refer to us as his iron division. At 1 a.m. on the morning of July 15, 1918, my division became the target of bombardment. As we took cover in our trench, a shell detonated nearby and wounded my corporal and my sergeant. I was killed instantly. My unit retreated from the position, but returned a week later. Although he searched for my body, my sergeant was unable to find me. The war ended on November 11th, 1918. That night, at 6 o'clock p.m., four months after I died, my mother received a letter from the Red Cross. It stated that even though there was no official record of my death, she must not hope me to be a prisoner. I was the sixth Tamako casualty of World War I. It was not until early in 1921, a year and a half after the war ended and two and a half years after I was killed, that the army positively identified me. I was relocated to different graves three times before being laid to rest in Wazain American Cemetery and Memorial in Northern France. My mother was asked three times from 1930 to 1932, to join a military-funded Gold Star pilgrimage to the cemetery, but her health prevented her from going. She and my father died without ever visiting my resting place. My confirmation hymn, which my mother asked to be buried with me, says, With enemies on every side, we lean on thee, the crucified, forsaking all on earth beside. I was 22 years old when I died fighting a war I had not expected to join. My death was in service to my God, but it was also in service to my country, and above all, to you. I'm back in the White Church Cemetery in Rush Township now, visiting the resting place of Harold Messerschmidt, one of Schuylkill County's very few recipients of the Medal of Honor, the nation's highest honor for valor in action. Sergeant Messerschmidt was killed in 1944 in France, and the medal was presented to his parents two years later in 1946. For me, the most meaningful part of this service has always been the reading of the names of those veterans we have lost since the previous Memorial Day. This year, however, I'm delegating that honor, and I'm delegating it to you, the citizens of Tamaqua. At the conclusion of the roll call, military honors will be rendered as wreaths are laid at the three Tamako monuments.
By reciting the names of our recently deceased veterans, we are linking them to the sacrifices and heroism of those who fought in generations past. In life, they honored the flag, but in death, the flag honors them. Oliver J. Angelus. Robert A. Bockert. Catherine K. Baddock. Martin J. Baddock. Woodrow E. Benson, Jr. Raymond T. E. Bottoms. Kenneth H. Brooks. Andrew Bugdanavich. Jean H. Buell. Kenneth H. Coleman. William E. Coombe. Robert H. Davis. Richard P. Dreisbach. Thomas E. Edwards. Don D. Emmerich. David C. Faust. Neil Flexer, Sr. Samuel W. Geisinger. Alex Harvilla. Byron G. Hess. Jean N. Hirsch. Larry G. Hoppus. Leonard Hoppus. William Hiroschak. Raymond Y. Kevely. Andrew F. Kidda, Jr. Robert M. Kleinhagen. Robert M. Niddle. James J. Knowles. Gus P. Constas. Daniel M. Lazar. John E. Martin. Alan E. Miller. Frank D. Moore, Sr. Kenneth W. Moyer. Helmut R. Mueller. Leo J. Pedron, Jr. Milton R. Rausch. John H. Shikram. John F. Shuck. Martin J. Sedlock, Sr. Brian K. Shower, Sr. John J. Sherbin. David T. Snyder. Harry K. Snyder. William J. Summers. John Starry. Edwin W. Staggerwald. Elwood W. Staggerwald. Leander D. Staggerwald Jr. Charles Tucker. William G. Valinch. Paul S. Yeager. Terry R. Lena. Fire guard. It's it. Point. Present. Point. Ready. Hey. Fire. Hey. Fire. Hey. Fire. Present. Point. Day is done, gone the sun, from the lake, from the hills, from the sky, all is well, safely rest, God is nigh. Thanks and praise.
for their days neath the sun neath the stars neath the sky as we go this we know God is nigh while the light fades from sight and the stars gleaming rays softly send to thy hands we In order of appearance, that was the honor detail of the American Legion C.H. Berry Post number 173, Tamaqua's Mayor Nathan Grace, Poppy Queen Emily Belts, and Grand Marshal Brian Dom. Singing taps was Emily Barrett, a Tamaqua graduate and student of theater arts at the Sales University. I'm now standing in St. Bertha's Cemetery in Tuscarora, visiting the resting place of Marine Edward Blasco. Edward was killed in Korea in 1952 and left behind parents and 10 brothers and sisters. Pastor, please lead us in a word of benediction. I'm visiting Bethany United Methodist Church Cemetery in Barnesville in the resting place of Elmer Heckman from Quakeake. Elmer was a bombardier and was killed when his plane crashed in 1944. Let us pray together. Our Father, as we have come to the end of our time today, remembering those that have gone before us, those that have laid down their lives for their country, we pray that you'd help us to remember everything we've seen and everything we've heard here today. Every poem, every special piece of music, every reflection, we pray as we look around at the faces of those, young and old, help us to know that these, many of them, are family members of those that have gone ahead of us. But also, Lord, as we look beyond to the rest of us, help us to remember that we are the beneficiaries of what these men and women did. None of them went off to war to die, but they were willing. So help us now, Lord, as we are here in 2020, going through things in our nation we have no experience with, to remember their sacrifice and their dedication, and help us to look to you as we go forward, looking for justice, looking for truth and righteousness, looking for a way forward as we seek to be one nation under God. Now, Lord, go with us to our various places. Bless us in the year to come. Be with us. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. And so this service comes to a close, back at Soldier's Circle and Odd Fellows, in the resting place of someone with a unique story to tell. This grave holds the remains of a soldier who died in the Civil War two days after General Lee's surrender. His headstone, which is weathered almost to illegibility, reads Louis H., son of Peter and Sarah Sterner, Born March 8, 1843, died April 11, 1865, of treatment received while in rebel prison. O oh, cease, ma and pa, cease your weeping, above the spot where I am sleeping. My time was short, and blessed be he that called me to eternity. Thank you to all of our service participants, the citizens of our area who volunteered to read the names of our veterans, and a special thanks to Ron Endes Cabbage for the work in compiling this video. Finally, thank you, the viewers, for taking a few moments today to hold true to the intent of Memorial Day. I hope you have a wonderful day.